like to introduce to you our main speaker this evening, Dr. Trevor Thomas of Ocean Mine. And Trevor gained his PhD at Cambridge 40 years ago in speech recognition. And he's worked at at and Bell Labs in speech recognition and speaker recognition. And he had a short career break and for the past seven years, he's been working with Ocean Mind, which is a spin-off non-profit organization, which span out of the satellite applications catapult on the Harwell campus, part of the space cluster at Harwell. He's now working on something which has great social impact, has much more appeal than the technology involved. And I think that will come out during this talk. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to Trevor. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, we've got a small technical challenge here to get this, to get the, the presentation on the screen. Um, so I'm sure it'll come up in just a moment. That's okay, we can edit this out. Okay. <laughs> During Trevor's talk, you can put questions into the Q&A tool in Zoom, and then we will review the questions after Trevor has finished speaking. Yeah. Right, I'm in business. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about you know, using artificial intelligence to uh, combat illegal fishing and modern day slavery. Uh, as Ian alluded to in my talk, um, in, my, in my introduction, uh, I've been doing time domain pattern matching all my career. And uh, I'm, until recently, I've been working in speech recognition, but uh, I was given the opportunity to do something a lot more interesting, a lot more revolutionary, and hopefully very useful. And uh, with Ocean Mind. So I'm going to talk about the activities that we're trying to uh, stop or understand uh, by using artificial intelligence techniques to help our fishing analysts cope with the barrage of data that's coming towards them from the millions of fishing vessels that are out in the ocean. Just as an introduction, uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about what commercial fishing looks like before I delve into the algorithms. Uh, this is one of our standard commercial slides, but one of the most interesting things I find here is that the livelihood of 12% of the world's population is uh, tied up with the oceans. There are very many uh, millions of fishing vessels going around, as many, very, many, many, many millions of support vessels going around. And while I'm surprised it makes up 12%, it is a considerable number. Anyway, let's have a look at the overview of the challenge. Uh, then I'll talk about how uh, we've been working to try and reduce the complexity of all of this data so that we can work out what is going on and guide our analysts and our supporters to make intelligent decisions. I'm gonna talk a bit about the algorithm development. I'm going to mention a little bit about the accuracy, but also I'm gonna talk about the implementation of these algorithms. This is crucial, really. Uh, while I'm a researcher at heart, we have to make these algorithms deployable. Uh, there's so much needs to be done and uh, having something that runs too slowly or too much hardware is too much of a challenge. So I'm gonna start with an introduction about commercial fishing. This is an image taken by Tim Peake uh, some years ago. Many of you may have seen it. It was uh, published by uh, him when he was up in the International Space Station. And this is an image of primarily fishing vessels taking doing their activities in the Gulf of Thailand. We have at the top here, Bangkok. That's the, that's the border of the land there. This is the border of the land over on the east side going towards Cambodia. And all of these, all of these uh, little dots here, the green and the white dots, almost all of them will be fishing vessels here. There are a few non-fishing vessels. There is a uh, container port up there, but 
almost all of those are fishing vessels at night. Later on in the talk, I'm going to explain why there's some dark patches here, which is actually rather interesting. Um, those of you uh, who might be interested, the green lights on the previous uh, slide, actually light vessels, they don't actually do any fishing themselves and they look like this. Uh, they illuminate the waters and uh, other vessels come around and fish around them. The, the lights, of course, attract the uh, squid and octopuses, etc. Just to set this in context, this is a map a snapshot which we made a couple of years ago, I suppose now, I can't be honest to remember, of all of the vessels that we're tracking just using one of the two main tracking systems in the world. Uh, this is uh, using a system called AIS, which I should talk about in a little minute. Uh, but there's many millions of vessels around here, but no, by no means all of them are fishing vessels. We can see the shipping lines here going around South Africa. We can see shipping lines going through the, the Gulf. And uh, all of those would be uh, anything from uh, car transports to oil tankers. But the majority of the vessels certainly near the equator in the middle of the Pacific and uh, over in the Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean are uh, fishing vessels. There's many, many thousands of them going around at any one time. I thought I'd introduce to you some of the prime techniques that people use for fishing um, commercially in the world. Uh, I know when I started working with Ocean Mind, I was uh, knowledge free in this area. And I was comprised about the, the scope of it and the scale of it all. So I thought I'd uh, show you some, some of the, the techniques that he used and what the vessels actually look like. And uh, I say, I must thank the Sea Shepherd for providing these images for us to use. The main kind of fishing that takes place in the ocean, the, the, the kind of fishing that catches most fish uh, is, is called purse sailing. Uh, these vessels are very long. Um, they often have helicopters on the front. I suppose these days they have drones, but they have helicopters on the front. And they have a small boat at the back. They could be 200 meters long. And this is a vessel that lays out a purse net like this around a shoal of fish. It uses the helicopter to go up in the air to find out where either the surface of the water is being upset or seabirds are diving in or anything that might hint that there's a shoal of fish there. Once it thinks it's found one, the little boat is launched off the side and a big net is deployed all the way around the shoal. And when the, uh, when the net has been completed, the bottom is pursed up and the haul is then recovered by the vessel. Everything in commercial fishing is large. This is one in action, again, a, an image from Sea Shepherd here. Um, you can see the size of the net. That vessel is probably 200 meters long. So this is many kilometers uh, in diameter, a couple of kilometers, I should think, in diameter. There's another one actually just about to do its stuff over there uh, as well, I think. Uh, I'm not very good. I'm not a fishing expert, but I think that's so I'm going along. So that's the main kind of fishing. And I think, if memory serves, something like 40% of all the fish caught is caught using this technique. Uh, the second kind, which I'm going to talk about, is long lining. Uh, this is a long lining vessel. This is an image uh, provided by the United States Navy. This is a vessel that got itself into trouble, and the United States Navy came to help. Uh, a long lining vessel deploys a line from the back of the boat. Uh, there's various techniques, but the one I'm going to talk about, it deploys a line in the back of the boat, boat like that. Uh, and the boat steams forward and the line is deployed, deployed behind it. It's automatically held up by buoys at the height at which they want the hooks to be deployed. And then after it's been soaking for a bit, the, uh, the, the vessel retraces its steps and the, there's a crane here and the, the crane use, is used to recover the, the catch. This catch is high quality fish, fish. The fish aren't bashed together in nets. They're all dangling on the on their own separate hooks. And so, uh, Primary things like the large tuna, like the expensive blue fish tuna, would, would be caught like this. There's a, quite a lot of quite a lot of these going on. There are many thousands of each of these kinds of vessels going on. The third kind of vessel is the one which we're I'm certainly more familiar with around the coast of the United Kingdom, which is trawling. There's many kinds of trawling, and this is where uh, a boat pulls a net behind it. Uh, this particular kind technique has a lot of board here, which when the current wind is being pulled along is held apart. Uh, spreads out and keeps the bottom of the net wide. However, in the open ocean, they're not the small vessels that we see around here. This is what the trawlers look like. You see these occasionally in the United Kingdom. They're very often called super trawlers or something. But in fact, there's nothing super about them. This is what the trawlers look like in the open ocean. Uh, at the moment, we can, uh, we're tracking upwards of 10,000 of these around the ocean at the moment. There's uh, a lot going on. 
Just to introduce uh, my final corporate slide here, this is the kind of summation of the activity which Ocean Mine does. We take information uh, as far as you can, everything from vessel tracking, which is what I'm primarily talking about today, to including things like satellite observations uh, from either European Space Agency or commercial companies or NASA, uh, information about the regulations about where fishing is allowed to take place and the licenses of these vessels, uh, and also information about local conditions as well. We work all over the world. Um, we, I, I think we work in about 40 or 50 countries at the moment, and certainly our partners work in many countries. And we condense all that information using our artificial intelligence algorithms and provide information both to our own uh, fishing analysts and to our partners for them to actually produce condensed information then to authorities, to companies, to fish, seafood buyers, to governments, where whoever wants to earn, uh, learn from us. So I'm not going to talk about satellite image processing, which is very important. I'm not going to talk about how we collect the information about the vessels and the licensing, which of course is also very important. I'm going to talk about how we track the vessels and how we analyze the data for that tracking. There are two kinds of tracking systems available in the world. There's something called automatic identification system. This is AIS. This was a, a worldwide system. It was originally invented to uh, stop vessels colliding near ports. So large vessels originally had this and they would transmit frequently to other vessels nearby. There's, they would transmit their location and their course and their speed and the other vessels could see whether they're likely to collide with them. Uh, this has been extended in its use uh, to provide uh, information for companies like me, uh, like Ocean Mind, like my company, uh, by collecting data worldwide. We've got many, uh, we, but we are provide data providers on many satellites uh, orbiting the Earth now, which can receive these transmissions. And so long as the vessels are transmitting, we can see where they are. At the moment, we're, we're, we're monitoring about a million of these vessels. Uh, they're not by any means all of the fishing vessels, that's for sure. We monitor oil tankers and for pollution purposes and other vessels as well. The other type of data source is vessel monitoring system. Uh, this actually provides similar pieces of information like location and direction and uh, time at which, which particular vessel happens to be at that time, but it's not public information. Uh, unlike AIS, you just pay your money to a provider and they'll provide it for you. This is country or regional based. This is very high quality data, but getting hold of this is very hard. You have to work with the country or the region involved. Um, it's, it has a different purpose, though. It's primarily used for fishing fleet monitoring, provides very high quality data. So some of the results that I'm going to talk about today, the majority of them are using VMS, uh, but some of them are with AIS too. I've shown you that slide before, and actually I'm repeating myself just to, just to identify that there's a large number of fishing vessels in the middle of the ocean. Let me just show you um, some more details about where fishing actually takes place. All of this information I'm going to show you on the next two slides only comes from AIS. So it comes from the big international services. This, of course, is, uh, is the ocean uh, and the world. The green lines we see here are the extent of the exclusive economic zones around uh, all the maritime countries. They're 200 nautical miles. And uh, as you see there, they cover everywhere that's 200 nautical miles away. Everywhere else that is not within the 200 northern miles is the high seas. And different laws apply. And to say it's a free for all, under, um, it's, it's kind of a free for all. There are licenses there, but there's very little, it's very little monitoring. If I show you here, this is a heat map of where our algorithms have identified trawling to take place. Um, remember, this is just the AIS center. Everywhere around the coast of Africa, India, uh, the Far East, and certainly over here, there's a great deal of trawling going on, but that's proprietary information. You don't know what's going on there. Many, many, many millions of vessels are fishing with trawling techniques. But the large vessels, the large ocean going vessels, as you can see, there's a lot going on here. North of Norway and Russia, there's quite a lot over in the Far East in Russia. There's a great deal around the United Kingdom as well. But it's primarily, as you can see, in the colder climates here. I don't know, actually. I, I was thinking this as I was working on my presentation. Uh, a lot of trawling actually takes place uh, near fish farms and aquacultural centers, because trawlers uh, trawl for fish, which they then provide as fish food to the uh, fish in, the, in, the, uh, in their farms. And I suspect some of it may be like that. I'm not, I'm not sure, actually. I'm, 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 that's one of my research activities to see what's going on there. If I move on to uh, longlining, longlining and per se mostly takes place in the tropics. 
Now, as you can see, there's large, large areas of activities around off the uh, French Polynesia and in uh, the Southern Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean here. Uh, there's an uh, extremely large amount of long lining going on. One thing I forgot to say is I often ask my audiences how long the line is, uh, long lining, and they people push the boat out and they, they say 200 metres or 300 metres. You have to go large here. These lines are probably 125 to 150 kilometres long. Uh, this is, you know, they, these, these are very serious lines. So um, I live in Cambridge. So if the line were deployed from here in Oxford, it would go well beyond Cambridge. You'd go to Bury St Edmunds, or equally going down to um, Swansea. Uh, it, would go, it would go well beyond uh, Birmingham, of course. It, they, these are seriously long lines. Um, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary what's, what takes place. And if I zoom into French Polynesia, you can see that this is just a year's worth of activity, by the way. Uh, I'll that. You can actually see, those of you who are close to the screens, can actually see that a lot of the activity here is oriented in a north-south fashion. There's actually some going here horizontally. And the reason why it's so carefully controlled north or south or east or west is that very often fleets do this at the same time, um, particularly uh, the large countries, the largest country that operates the large fishing vessels is China. I think they're probably, they're probably almost as big as everybody else put together. I don't think that's the case, but they're very large. And uh, so they would have a fleet of these and the vessels would go up and down, up and down together. And of course the lines are 150, 120 kilometers long and they have to coordinate themselves otherwise they will get tangled. So that's why they're behaving like that. Thank you. The persaining mostly takes place in the uh, tropical waters as well, That's, although there are some taking place elsewhere. And until I produced this heat map, I didn't know there was any taking place near Svalbard, but there we are. Um, again, this is all AIS data. There's plenty of, plenty of fishing taking place using VMS data as well. Um, it doesn't look like there's very much going on here compared to the long lining, but the reason is, is that purse sailing doesn't move around very much when it's fishing. It stays in the same place and just builds its great big purse net. So it does a lot of fishing in a very small area, then moves somewhere else and does a lot of fishing in a small area. Whereas the long lining covers 125 kilometers in its single fishing pass. Just for interest, I thought I'd overlay in detail um, onto Google Earth, some fishing taking place around Iceland and the north of Scotland and the Faroe Islands. You can see here on Google Earth where the edge of the continental shelf is. And again, from Scotland, then there's that continental shelf up by Greenland. The green lines are again the exclusive economic zones. And in this part of the world, before you ask me, there are a variety of shared areas here. Uh, various countries share the responsibility. This is how our engine calculates where fishing is taking place using trawling. And you can actually see very, very clearly if I go backwards, uh, if you look here along Greenland and you look along the edge here, you can see how highly correlated it is with the edge of the continental shelf. There's no surprise there. The, the fishing analysts tell me they, that the fish come up from the bottom of the ocean, they rise up the cliff of the continental shelf, and then they're afraid to get caught. One thing we do here, see here very clearly as well, is the effect of the economic zone boundaries. These vessels here are not licensed to fish in, in Iceland, and so therefore they fish really closely to the boundary, but on the whole try not to stray into it. These vessels here are uh, got licenses to fish in Greenland, but not, not in Iceland. And you can see the effect of that very strongly here in, in, in these areas around Norway. What do we do with this data? How do we start processing it? There are, I don't remember to be honest, how many fishing vessels we're processing uh, on a daily basis, but it's in the hundreds of thousands at the moment. A track, as we recover it from the vessel, bear our partners, looks like this on the right hand, on the left hand side. This is a vessel that's fishing off the Verde Islands, which is off the coast of Africa in um, the Atlantic. The black line here, the black line, that's the exclusive economic zone of the Cape Verde Islands. And what we're looking at here is location information for 100 days of fishing for this particular vessel. The scale here, the grid line scale is 220 kilometers or so, it's two degrees. Uh, so it's in areas, of course, but it's about 220 kilometers. I can tell that this is a long line because he's doing this scribble pattern. What I do is for presentation purposes, I process this data through our algorithms and I get the algorithms to interpret what is taking place and oppose colors on the, on the graph. So here we have um, the bright green is where the vessel is steaming around, not fishing. There's a fair bit of bright green going around. 
Annoyingly, the slightly darker green is actually when the fishing vessel is actually recovering the line. And uh, it's a bit hard to choose. And I'm, I'm going to change the colors next time I do this presentation. The red line is actually when the algorithm has identified that the long line is being set. So here we have the long line being set there, the vessel waits at the end, and then it comes back to recover the line. And then it moves up to the next state, does it again the next day, moves up and does it again the next day. For interest, those yellow circles there, they're a different kind of long line. So instead of waiting at the end of the line, it, it sets the line, comes back to the beginning and recovers the line from the beginning. So it looks like a loop. And the, the algorithm identifies that as well as a different kind of fishing. Now, what we do is we identify all, the, all these fishing activities. We see that there's probably 80 or so days worth of fishing within the economic zone of Cape Verde Islands and some, some fishing that's in the, in the high seas. We check the licenses of this particular vessel to see whether it's got fishing rights in the Cape Verde Islands and in the high seas in, in this particular area of the Atlantic. Uh, and if it has, that's okay. And if it hasn't, uh, we may actually decide if our partners are interested to alert the authorities that this particular fishing is taking place. Now, just I would show you a little video of something whilst you uh, of a some daily activity in some trawling from Thailand. This is Thailand here. The, the land part of Thailand is to the south of the yellow line. That's the um, that's the board, that's the land sea boundary. The green areas are various restricted areas in Thailand, uh, which uh, fishing is not allowed to take place. The green areas up here are various areas uh, with uh, uh, where fishing is again not allowed to take place. But this is Malaysia down here, and that's the um, economic zone boundary between the main, uh, Malaysia and Thailand, and they, they share this restricted area up here. Over on the left, over on the right hand side, we have a time graph with a uh, time. This is one day's worth of activity. And this is the speed of the vessel. The speed is in nautical miles, and nautical miles approximately 1.1 mile, or very nearly two kilometers. Uh, the light portion of the graph is when it's daytime locally, and the dark is when it's nighttime locally. Now, as I've already alluded, the engine for display purposes decodes what he believes is taking place uh, by using different colors and symbols. And the black symbol means the vessel is in port. The vessel is actually over there, but I, can't, I can really not see it until it moves. But if I play the video, we can see the vessel moving out on a daily basis. This is a trawler and it's moving up and down and trawling and I've lost my controls. There we go. Just to pause it just for a second. It's moving up and down doing trawling activities. The engine is decoding the trawling activity as red circles. So in this particular case, we've got three trawls and the blue line, the blue triangles here, are when the engine believes the vessel is hauling back the net. So the trawls, of course, pulls the net. It can occasionally, three, in this case, three times a day, the crew stops the boat, they haul in the net, cap, they bring the catch up onto the deck, sort it all out, and then they deploy the net again, and they do it again. Now, one of the things that we want to observe is how much effort the crew is um, being made to, made to employ during the day to make sure they're not being overworked. And so we're exploring the idea of actually spotting the vessel uh, hauling it and deploying the net, so in this case three times, and we are attempting to uh, associate that amount of uh, work with a, a particular amount of time and check to see whether the crews are being overworked or not. Now, I'm going to give you some results on that a little bit later, but this is certainly early work at the moment. Uh, I thought I'd show you a different kind of trawling around uh, Iceland, so that's uh, just for interest. This is from AIS data, so there's many, many, many four points. This is the north of Iceland, that's green, the Greenland there, that's the economic zone boundary between them, and that's an internal water in, 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 in Greenland that's irrelevant up here. Again, the red is where the engine believes trawling is taking place, the blue is where the vessel is moving but not, um, not fishing, and there's various other activities as well, which you occasionally see, like the vessel actually stays stationary, or the green one means it's going into port. So as you can see, what we try to do is to decode the whole track. It's a time domain problem as I'm envisaging it. We don't look at each individual point by itself. We try and build everything into a sentence. And this is of course coming from my background of speech recognition where you try and decode everything. I just thought I'd show you some other ones just to show you how different they look. Uh, this one is uh, per seining um, and it's a very, very different kind of activity. Uh, oh gosh, I pressed the wrong button. Um, this is, uh, let me try that again. This is per seining here. 
And if I stop it at a convenient point, there we go. There, that is actually a per saning activity. As you can see, spatially, it doesn't take up very much space, but the red has been identified by the computer engine saying that was a per saning activity. And in, I've just gone slightly too far, but it actually drops the net just about an hour or two after sunset on that one, I think. Um, but you can see it, it has a completely different style. And I thought I'd show you long lining as well, just for a bit of fun. Uh, this is long, long, long lining off the coast of Colombia here. Um, as again, if you, if you recall, um, the long lines are about 125 kilometers long. And I'm absolutely amazed that they're allowed to long line here when they're really close to the Panama Canal and all the large um, uh, some container vessels, etc., are coming through the Panama Canal and going up to Europe and Africa along here. I don't see how they don't get tangled with it. Um, but they don't. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what it looks like. So this is uh, the engine is decoding. This is long lining, and it's deciding in this particular case that the yellow color is when the line is being set, and the gray color is when the line is being recovered. It's a very repetitive operation. It does it day after day after day. And uh, as you can see, it's a long line. Again, the grid the grid squares are two uh, two hundred and twenty or so kilometers apart. So you can see how long this line is. It really is. Quite an extensive activity. I've got actually, I've got quite a few of them doing this at the same time, but it, the, for display purposes, it gets a bit messy, but you can see them all going up and down. It's really quite fun. Finally, occasionally, if you're really lucky, we want to try to spot transshipments taking place. This is an image of a transshipment taking place between a long liner and a, uh, a refrigerated supply, uh, refrigeration vessel, which takes off known as the catch. Uh, in the ocean here. This was uh, provided to us by Digital Globe, which is very nice. And if you zoom in a bit, you can actually see the long liner along the side of the, uh, of the refrigeration vessel. We want to spot these as well, because while transshipments can be entirely illegal, it's entirely possible that fishing vessels offload their catch illegally in the ocean to a uh, refrigeration vessel, and then they carry on fishing. So when they're getting deported, it does not appear that they uh, exceeded their quotas. That's really quite a serious problem. So we try and monitor that as well. And we build algorithms to try and spot that happening. I just thought I'd show you uh, a time domain of a transshipment taking place here. This is a long liner that we can see on the right-hand side. And by the way, you have to be quick on this one, otherwise you'll blink. A, a supply vessel comes in from the Northwest here. And when it's actually supplying a, when it's actually supplying a fishing vessel, it, it turns red, the, the, the track turns red. You can't see it at the moment. There are two tracks being displayed here. This is the fishing vessel and this is the supply vessel. You can't see it's off the top of the screen. Um, there are a lot of fishing vessels on this image and I've got them all, but I only display one for presentation purposes. Otherwise it looks like it's a great big tangle. But in a second, we'll see the long lining take place. Here's the fishing vessel taking place. That is the transshipment there and they've, they've gone past each other. So again, the supply vessel does lots and lots of transshipments. If you didn't see it, as I said, you haven't been quickly, they kissed each other for about five hours in the middle and they, just, they did their work then. I, there's no, no suggestion this is, in, this is illegal at all. It's just that that's what they do. And um, the algorithms attempt to identify the transshipment. In this case, I run out of colors, of course, for, for displaying all of these things. So this looks like fishing, it is. It's actually transshipment in this case. It's, uh, it's just using the same symbol. So just to summarize then, we want to identify uh, activities that possibly are illegal. Um, as I say, you know, fishing in restricted areas or fishing without a license, we want to spot transshipments, because they may be illegal. Many, many most of the time they are legal. We want to spot port visits. Um, believe it or not, there is no one exhaustive list of all the ports in the world. Um, we've got about 12 and a half thousand on our list and um, there's plenty more to go. Um, we've obviously got big ports, but there's, there's, there's plenty more to go. We also want to identify periods of missing data. If you're going to be illegal and you're transmitting your location all the time, it's not very hard to spot where you are. So you can always put a, a basically a bag over the transmitter or um, any one and uh, go dark if you do so. We try and spot that too. We try and spot that illegal. And if we think there's something fishy going on, sorry about the word, but if there's something fishy going on, we actually um, send the satellites in and try and take pictures of them. It can be done, it's hard work and quite expensive. We also want to know, of course, what, what fishing gear is being used. The fishing gear is important because the licenses are based upon the fishing gear. And also, as I alluded to, we, we started work on this. So this work is very preliminary here. How much crew effort is being employed every day to try and identify illegal crew activity? Uh, I should say, actually, uh, press ganging is, is rife, apparently, in the Far East. 
Um, now, we, we track vessels that don't ever go to port. I've got years and years of data of some vessels that don't go to port. I've got, I, can, I know which vessels supply them because they get supplied, of course, and I get, I'm guessing that they do crew changes. I've no idea whether it's illegal or, or illegal, but it'd be interesting to know why they never go to port. So that's the data available, and that's an overview of change. Let's look at some of the algorithms. This is a bit, it's not massive, don't get too excited. There's no maths in this today. Um, let's look at some of the algorithms that we use. Um, I have a speech recognition background, as I said, possibly three times and now four times. So I've deployed speech recognition techniques, certainly from my generations, I've been doing it beyond. Uh, so I've built a continuous decoder that decodes the track into what you might call words, activities, into a complete sentence. And I'm doing that using a stochastic grammar. Uh, I decode it using uh, what I think these days is called soft but I've adapted it to handle MBEST inferences and it can handle uh, a, a variety of optional uh, grammars being introduced and uh, removed as well. The underlying instantaneous decoding I perform using deep neural networks and hidden Markov models. Um, as you can imagine, when I started uh, deep neural networks for a only pie in the sky, but uh, we're moving towards them slowly. But the majority of the, the basic decoding at the moment is using HMMs, but there is quite a lot of DNNs going on in there as well. And also, it's a multi pass algorithm. I haven't managed to do it all in one go. In the same way as when you're recognizing speech, you don't really process everything in one go. You, you have to retrace your steps and understand what's going, going on. For example, you know, if you see, if you hear the sentence, um, the man saw the dog with a telescope. When, as soon as you hear the word telescope, you realize it's the man who's got the telescope. But if you change a sentence to the man saw the dog with the bone, you know, who's got, the, who's got the bone, you have to change your interpretation. So we do that all the time. And we change the way in which the grounds are working. Crucially for us, our partners and our customers want a kind of real-time response. It's no good having to look ahead too long. Um, a lot of algorithms that you see in academia uh, attempt to do uh, this kind of analysis, and they have the luxury of being able to look ahead in time, perhaps by two days or perhaps by even a week. Nothing wrong with that at all to see what is possible. Uh, but we don't have that luxury. So I tend to limit the amount of look ahead which the grammar can support to, I say about one, one point, but it varies. It's up to about three or four hours at most. And we do that primarily so we can, we can provide real-time information to our partners. If something's happening, they want to know straight away, particularly if it's close to the shore, so they can catch the nugget. It needs to be computationally tract tractable as well. Uh, we, don't, we can't use too much memory. Uh, we can't afford to have too much computation going on because all of our processing is done on the Azure cloud and basically the company will go bust if we let our ideas run wild on that one. Interestingly, interestingly, a very large number of polygons need to be processed. We need to know whether we're inside countries or economic zones or various restricted areas. And the standard algorithms for working this information out, particularly how close you are to the boundaries, were just not fast enough. And we've had to roll our own for that. I'm very pleased with that one as well, because otherwise that would completely overwhelm the processing. So even though it seems a peripheral algorithm, it's actually cru completely crucial. The sort of features that we use is very interesting. Now, I come from a speech background, that's five plans now. I come from a speech background and it's been plainly, you can plainly tell that you can recognize the words of speech just by listening to the talker. You don't need to know what clothes they're wearing or whether they had breakfast or not, or whether it's hot or cold outside. You need to know that information from the semantics and what they're talking about, sure, but not just the words. We don't know that information here. Um, we use the latitude and longitude uh, and time information. We introduce dynamic features as much as we can, such as acceleration speed. Time of day is important, uh, as is the proximity of the ports and land. Uh, all sorts of different activities take place there. We also introduce the, the depth of the ocean and there's long-term features to capture daily repetitive behavior, which we've developed as well. But other things, we have no knowledge about how important they are. Some clearly are, uh, like weather conditions. It's clear that fishing will not work. Fishing will stop in a force 10 day. So it'd be nice to know that we don't include that. That information is available, but we don't, we don't know that. We don't know anything about the effect of uh, ocean salinity or algae blooms. Uh, or whether uh, they're fishing in known areas or fishing near um, fishing uh, protection vessels. We don't know anything about that at the moment. So there's a lot more to be done. I can't wait to find out. Now, I'm going to show you some information about the rep repetition 
This is a trawler. This is, in, this is interesting. These vessels do the same thing day after day after day. This is a trawler. That's the land here. We're looking at a day's worth of data. And what I'd like to ask you to do is concentrate on what I'm showing you, the day by day data. Uh, look at where the blue lines are, because the blue lines show where the vest, where the line is, is being recovered. I'm going to show you a video of this, and it's going to step. Um, it's important at the moment. It's going to step a day at a time. And here we go. You can see, just concentrate on the stationary bits, like the one in the middle of the night. That's when it's a tanker, the green line is. But again, you see, it settles down doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's, we can make use of this information. It's important that we do. Uh, because it, that distinguishes one kind of trawling from another. This, uh, this is something called a pair trawler, which does this repetitive behavior. Other trawlers like being trawlers do not. And the one we saw uh, around the coast of, uh, for example, Iceland does not do this either. So it helps us to distinguish between uh, different kinds of trawling. This is, a, this is repetitive behavior of long lining. This is actually one of the tracks I think we've seen before. Uh, that's a day's worth of long lining. And if I put a second day on top of it, uh, you can see that over on the right hand side, we're looking at three days worth it's going up and down in the same way. In this case, it's the, uh, I'm afraid the colors change every time I do the presentation of this one. Uh, the, the khaki colors are when the line is being set, and this time it's, uh, it's gray when it's being recovered. And for day after day, so you do that. And that's, that's how it looks uh, for, I think that's about 100 days worth of fishing there. You can see it does some down here, then it moves over to the west on that one. And uh, if you just step it by day, you can see how repetitive, repetitive it is. This is extremely important to spot this information. So while we can't go forward in time, we can look backwards in time to be able to make use of this information. And here's a spectrogram, not of the track I'm showing on the left hand side, but this is a spectrogram, I think about a hundred days worth of data. It's got, um, it's not quite that much, it's two and a half million seconds. So uh, you know, that's, that's about a month worth of data here. But we've got, if you take a spectrogram here, you can see there's a large amplitude which corresponds to a, a periodicity of one day. And then there's harmonics at 12 hours and um, eight hours and things, just like you'd expect to see in a repetitive spectrum. We make use of this information because it's different for long liners. It's different for trawlers. Different kinds of trawlers do different kinds of things. First liners don't do this at all. Uh, the squid juggers don't do it at all though. Um, the gill netters do something a bit different to this one. So there's all this information that we can make use of. Now, how do we do the processing? This is how the inference engine looks in a kind of easy square box fashion. Uh, as I was explaining to some of my, uh, some of my colleagues earlier uh, today, signal conditioning is extremely important here. Strangely, the data is extremely noisy. You in fact saw that a little bit earlier, and that is that particularly when vessels are stationary, the, the data that we recover from the satellite suggests they're moving about 100 miles an hour. And even, even though the vessel hasn't moved at all, uh, we have to do a lot of feeding up. This is real data here that we have to handle. You know, um, basically, uh, experimental algorithms don't survive first contact with real data. You have to look at the real data to see what's going on. We do some feature extraction, and then we come to the pattern matcher properly. And the pattern matcher's got three stages to it. It's got what I call the spatial decoder here. So this is using HLM DNA models. What is actually happening at this point of time? So that's a kin in speech recognition to what particular sound am I making? I don't know, R, O, E, whatever it is. What's happening at that particular time? That's the, that's the job of the spatial decoders here. And I build the time domain processing into the stochastic grammar decoding uh, with the Viterbi. It's, it's a stochastic context-free grammar in a kind of limited way. It's sufficient for what we need here, I believe. And um, finally, I introduce a semantic layer and put some information in there about, for example, the, the vessel looks like it's going to go to port. How long is it going to take before it arrives in port? Such that we can warn the authorities at that port that this vessel is coming in. Um, vessels themselves have to announce that they're going to the port within, I think, something like two days of them actually arriving to, for the logistical purposes. Um, but we can, we can very often tell earlier than that that that's where they're going. And so we can provide that information. Also, information like the, the portion of the track is missing. The vessel appears to be fishing and it's gone dark two days and it hasn't moved. Something interesting has happened. Sorry, something fishy has happened. Can't, can't um, once you've got that characteristic information, um, we then decide to do, do we want to know whether the vessel is a long line or per se or whatever it is, or do we want to know, do some analysis on how much effort the crew is taking place? And if we do, we go around to the beginning, generally speaking, extract some other kind of features from it and go around and around again. Typically, you go around three or four times with this uh, to make it work. The grammar, I've drawn a simplified grammar here. The grammar's got approximately 500 states in the moment, and, and Walter's got some sub-grammars in as well. 
it's entirely it's entirely built statistically by the by the engine itself during training. But basically, it's a directed graph, and the vessel has to go through various stages. So if the vessel is important, it wants to go fishing, it has to go through the stage steaming from port before it can go fishing. And then when it wants to come back from fishing, it has to go to the state steaming to port. There's various subgrammars that you can have, like transshipment around. These are very useful to spot various activities. And again, if we want to deploy different kind of fishing technique our analyses, once we've identified general purpose fishing, we can go and say, does it look like a squid jigger or a trawler? Oh, a squid jigger is a funny name. It's a great big long vessel with, with uh, lights that come out at the side and uh, they use about a megawatt of lights to, uh, to illuminate the surface of the water. And so the squids come to the top and they can catch them all. Uh, I'm not showing you the squid jigger today. Um, we want to do some special purpose activities. Um, the authorities in Thailand were interested to know whether we could distinguish between 19 different types of fishing. I have to say that when I started, I couldn't even think of four different types of fishing, but now I can do 19, I can do more than 19 now. Um, you know, you get better at this. And uh, you know, other as the algorithms, as I said, things like the crew effort algorithms, which are coming on stream now. As is usual with the great complaint with all these artificial intelligence algorithms, we hardly have any training data. It's worse than this in this case, because unlike if you're trying to build an algorithm to, I don't know, take photographs of apples and oranges, you know whether it's an apple or an orange, there's no, no hesitation about it. A lot of this, we don't actually know. It's up to human interpretation about what's going on. So we find that the annotation is very hard to come by. We find that you get conflicting answers depending on which analysts are providing you the information. Nothing wrong with that, of course, like a lot of it is open to interpretation. But the approach that we take when we train all of the, all the states, you know, from the DNNs and the HMMs up to the grammar states. And also we do some feature vector, feature vector training as well. Um, we don't really like auto encoding yet. I'm sure that will come, but we haven't got time to, to play with that. We hand code some, we hand, hand label some data as best we can. We produce some models and we see whatever it makes and improve things and improve things. And we just go around that until we have something that we believe to be adequate. It takes quite a long time. So let's carry on then. We've shown you the algorithm a little bit about the activities and that the, we want to interpret. We've shown you a little bit about the algorithms and how they look on the ground. Let me talk about the accuracy. I'm going to show you, I think I've got three different types of algorithm accuracy to talk about here. Um, the first one is actually really quite concrete here. Can we distinguish between 19 different types of gear type in, in Thailand? This I know what the answer to this is, assuming that the fishing vessels are telling the truth, which they almost all are. And that is because we have the license information. These fishing vessels are licensed to one, or sometimes two or even three types of, of fishing. So we know what, when we know whether the, the algorithm is correct or not. That's really, really exciting. The second one is, um, what's the performance of the algorithm's ability to identify fishing in restricted regions? This is absolutely crucial, not only to spot uh, in, incursions into restricted regions, but we have to, provide a sufficiently accurate system such as to not bury the human analysts because humans have to go through this and check to see if it's right or not and even if you have an algorithm that might be say 99 percent accurate but you produce 200 000, uh, alerts a day saying there's incursions going on that means 2000 of them will be wrong and an analyst is just going to get sick of it if he has to go through 2000 a day that are wrong it's not good enough. We have to do something better than that. It's really, really quite distressing because humans get in the way. And it's important that humans are in the way because there's always human interpretation about what is actually going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about crew effort as well. But these are very preliminary figures, but I thought I'd introduce them just for fun. We've been doing this for a bit now. I'm going to present some results uh, to distinguish between 19 different gear types for 5,455 vessels active in Thailand between 2020 and April this, April this year. So that's two and a third years. Um, it was trained, it's been trained on data uh, before 2020. So we trained it on 2017, 2018, and 2019 data. The current accuracy when compared with a predicted gear type using 25 days of fishing prediction is 98.0%. That means it gets 2% of them wrong. Now, I'm really pleased with that. Um, here, is, here is an eye, eyesight test for you all. Uh, this is a confusion matrix of the license gear type against the inferred gear type. The license gear type is up the Y axis and the inferred gear type is on the X axis at the top. Um, the major types of fishing are the 
can't see through here, the, the perpetual is per sanus and the optical trawlers. The majority of fishing vessels are in those three categories. And you can see that it recognizes these particularly well. Not terribly surprisingly, it confuses the otter board and the pair trawlers. However, it still gets, in uh, one case, nearly 99% of them right. I should say, I'm not an expert. I can't tell these two apart at all. They're out there, to me, nearly identical. Experts can get them right, they think, probably 60 to 70% of the time. This is massively better than the humans. I'm really pleased. Some of the more esoteric types like, for example, the butterfish lifting net. I'm afraid I don't know what a butterfish is. I know what a lifting net is. It's something that goes up, they, they put it on the base, on, on the surface of, on the floor of the ocean, and then some fish go over the top and they lift it up. So I know what a lifting net is. No, I don't know what a butterfish is. It identifies all butterfish activity 100% of the time without any confusion at all, as it does with other things as well. We've got the, um, the krill push net here. Uh, a push net is where the, uh, a net is held out in front of the boat and it goes forward faster than the fish can escape. So that's, that's what a krill push net is. Some of them are not very well, well recognized, like the anchovy lifting net, which is very heavily confused with anchovy falling net and uh, anchovy per se. I, again, I'm not terribly surprised because I can't tell them apart. Fortunately, there aren't many vessels in this category, so it doesn't bring down your overall figure. But uh, it's, some of those areas are really hard. But some of them are very, very well recognized, like the per se is the major category here, per se. Oh, by the way, yeah, this, this is per se in Thailand, so it's not a two kilometer net. It's only about a hundred meter net. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any room for them all going at the same time. Uh, just to give you some idea, there's five and a half thousand vessels going on here every day in the Gulf of Thailand doing this. So there's a lot of fishing going on here. And just to put things into perspective, actually, and according to the uh, the fishermen, uh, it takes them now twenty times longer to catch a ton of fish than it did ten years ago in the Gulf of Thailand. I, I'm afraid that's really distressing. And all they're doing is they're just fishing more. So let's actually just look at what some of this is. Again, this is the Tim Peak image from the Golden Time. And I'm going to ask you now to have a look at this little area here, because this is a lot of fun. Uh, please ignore that dead area up there. I'm afraid I don't know why that doesn't have any fishing here, but I know why this doesn't. And maybe there's a cloud over there, because there's a lot of fishing taking place at the top. But over on the right hand side, I'm going to show you a video of pear shawling activity on a daily basis. You can whiz through each day, you can see where the day is. And you can see various boxes when particular restricted areas are in play. This is actually one, this particular box here is the same as that dark box over there. That's the same one. And uh, you can see this particular box is in play between mid-February and mid-April. So it'll come and go. To start with, there's not actually that much data because the system wasn't very active. And then you, you occasionally see some dropouts where the system is being tested. It's much better now. You can see all the fishing taking place around the, uh, around the restricted areas here. It's not restricted at this time of the day, but come February, it's gonna be, and everybody's going to escape it. Look at that. Isn't that exciting? So this is where the algorithm identifies pair trawling to be taking place. And then as soon as the restricted area get the goes, goes away, restriction goes away, they plow in again. And again, I'll show you again for the next year. It's, uh, it's rather fun to see how well they, they behave. The fishing vessels are very, very well behaved in time. Um, again, look at that. Isn't that exciting how, it, uh, how they go around the outside? And coming again. I should actually say, well, that's plain. Pair trawling is a pair of trawlers pulling one net, one on each side. Um, needless to say, because one, one vessel can't pull a big enough net these days. So they have two trawlers pulling each side and they're about 400 meters apart. So it's not like they're dressing to each other. One's over there and one's over there. And um, because they're so far apart, and this is such a congested area, um, there are plenty of examples of the, of the vessels crossing over in the middle and getting themselves into quite a tangle. And you can see it comes on. You can see it sometimes happen. Or, or alternatively, they, the net is so big that they completely trash uh, and over, over um, and destroy some of the uh, the, sh the, uh, the pots that are on the bottom. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be using bottom trawling, but I'm afraid they do sometimes. Let's just talk about the human analyst behavior. How it sees how it sees the algorithm behaving. In Thailand, the algorithm generates around about 4,000 fishing identifications of their activities every day. It says a net is being set, a line is being set, a, a pot is being dropped. There's about 4,000 of them every day. Um, there's also about 3,000 gear activities being identified every day. So basically what that's saying is, the engine is saying there are 3,000 vessels at the moment and this is what's happening. I'm surprised it's only 3,000 because there's usually about 5,000 vessels going. It's just that many of the vessels 
fish continent constantly for two or three days, or some of them for even 20 days. And so it, it doesn't actually produce an alert every day. So that's about 7,000 of these, these alerts going on every day. The engine believes that almost all of those are completely safe. We check against the licenses and we check against the restricted areas. But the engine identifies about 188 of them per day as being fishing incursions in restricted areas. It also gets about 20 gear mismatches every day. So it's about 200 mates altogether. Now, based upon feedback we get from the officers, the officers reject those of those 200 mates as being wrong, 5.3 per day. So that's about two and a half percent. Well, that's false positive. That's, that's what the algorithm appears to be doing. This is definitely wrong. I've checked through these, I've checked many hundreds of them, and the, the machine learning algorithms are wrong in that case. It does not, however, mean that of the other 200, they're, they're criminal offences, by no means at all. The majority of those are the vessels actually skimming, just going millimetres inside restricted areas. And the officers are, are giving leeway to say, well, that's just a millimetre inside, it wasn't intentional, so therefore they don't mind. It's not wrong. There are very, very few incursions which need following up. One of the things that's very difficult to get, it's very easy to get the false positives. It's very hard to get the false negatives. Um, based on my experience, it's really quite small. The, the officers don't usually rarely identify something that the algorithms have missed here. But, but basically, that's the algorithm performance we've got 5.3%, no, sorry, 2.5% false positive here. The other thing which we do is compare the uh, algorithms predictions against the log books as well. This is a particular static image of a trawler. And if the log books are up to date, it will log that this is a particular log set of a trawling activity. That's a set and that's a set. So there's one, two, three, four in this particular day. We've got these log books. Does the algorithm actually match that? We don't have much data at the moment. We're just starting a new activity to recover. It's probably at least 10 times more data than this. I can't wait to find, wait to find it. Um, so in this case, we have we've got some log books for 18, 18 vessels that um, had about 1,316 sets in them. The uh, engine identified two, 1,292 of those correctly. It, however, estimated that another 234 uh, sets took place, which were not in the logs. Now, if you believe the log books, um, the recall and precision, as I've, as I've written down here, 98% and 85%. However, it is certain. There's no question at all about it that the log books are not always accurate. But there are plenty of examples in which the engine has identified fishing to be taking place, which is very, very clear, and it's not in the log book just because they've forgotten it. That's fine, it's busy in the open ocean. So the log books have a number of errors. And equally, there's plenty of cases, there's a few cases, I should say, in which the engine, which the log book says we're fishing on this particular time in this day, and in fact they're in port. Um, so there's some day mismatches. This is fairly common in Thailand. I should say, because they use UTC, so they, have, they write everything down according to the uh, hours and minutes according to UTC, but they look at their local day. So and because they're seven hours ahead of UTC, um, so there's seven, seven chances out of 24, they'll get the wrong day. And so you have to check this really carefully. So there's, the, the logbooks are, have plenty, plenty in area here. So I can't wait to, when we get more data to actually work out what these figures actually are on that one. So I'll be able to get some more accurate ideas. Right, finally, let's talk a little bit about the implementation in near real time. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I've been going on quite a long time. I've almost had my hour. Um, everything we have is running on the ship. The algorithm is written in C and C++. We tried other, other, uh, other languages, but I'm afraid we really need the unpub below level language to get the throughput uh, on this. We have to process so much stuff. There, however, everything else is written in C sharp. The Azure implementation doesn't just supports the machine learning algorithms. It supports database access for our, our analysts, our own analysts and our partners analysts, so they can look at tracks and they can find out uh, their own transshipments. There's an awful lot going on. But just to give you some idea, on a, on a fairly typical uh, Azure machine, processing for a year's worth of data takes anything between five and 150 seconds, to, depending upon what's, what kind of activity is required. So that's quite a wide range. And it's, it's really not fast enough. I want to do something about that. Uh, this is... Uh, a graph from my colleague has produced this. This is my colleague who's responsible for our, our deployment. Uh, the machine learning algorithms are, are architecturally down here. The rest of it is describing how we handle the data. We can handle about a, a billion data points coming in a day, which is, I'm afraid, a very large number of data points. Uh, we can't, we never, we've never reached that many, but we can. 
handle about that many coming and going. I think I can't quite see. I think that's something like 500, 500,000 points a second or something. I can't remember what it is. It's a lot of data. No, it's 10,000 points a second. Got my units wrong. The data comes in there, it's sorted. And we do three kinds of processing with it. Uh, we do particular kinds of processing to, to look at the information by vessel. We want to look at it uh, according to the location of it. And we also want to look at it according to what's happened most recently as well. So everything is put into these queues. Uh, the machine learning algorithm processes at the moment mainly track by track, and that the results of that go into a database, which is also available as an API query. I think, yes. One of the most interesting things, actually, which I alluded to before, is we have to roll our own um, uh, processing for polygons. Uh, so I'm just going to show you some of the areas which, which our partners are interested in. Uh, this is uh, Google Earth, of course, and uh, overlaid with it is a variety of shapes uh, for various areas, just to show you the complexity that we have to handle here. And I'm delighted that this not works. So these are the exclusive economic zones. Uh, so each maritime country has one of those, but there's, they're really, really complicated. You know, particularly in large countries like Russia, there's many millions of points. Uh, I'm not exaggerating, millions of points on the boundary for these economic zones. And processing not just whether you're inside one of these polygons, or how is, but how far you're inside, and with the vast number of points we have to process, and say, um, you know, billions a day, uh, it, we have to really uh, do, have our work cut out to make sure it doesn't cause the whole system to seize up. There are other areas of two of interest. Uh, these are various um, tuna licensing areas. You can see there's uh, ICC, TN, you can't see the names because it's over right on the top of the screen, but there's the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, different kind of licensing areas, which we, which we track to check whether vessels are licensed or not. The uh, FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, also splits the oceans up into, into quite a large number of areas, most of them are squares or rectangles, as you can see. This is primarily for statistical purposes, so we have to report on that too. Um, we have about 12,000 ports. Uh, uh, you have to work out yourself, of course, where, where the countries are, but I think you can see that. Um, we're by no means covered with ports, but there's about 12,500 12 of them at the moment, which we want to know whether vessels are entering or not. And, uh, and finally, um, there's a very large number of marine protected areas, which we have to handle. Some of the ones that we're doing a lot of work on, for example, this one, this is the British Indian Overseas, British Indian Overseas Territory, that's uh, by the Chagos Islands, which is in the news at the moment. Uh, but there's plenty of other ones. Uh, and at this level, you can see that there's quite a few hundred, but in fact, all the way around the coast, there are very, very tiny ones. So if you just concentrate on that, I've got a zoomed in version of that just to show you the complexity of this. Um, if you just concentrate on the United Kingdom, you can see how many different uh, restricted, restricted areas we have United Kingdom and Ireland. I, I forget how many thousand of little areas there are on this map, but there are many, many thousand. Um, we can handle all of this stuff in real time. In fact, at the moment, um, we can look up whether any particular point is within any of these polygons and how far it is within the polygon. In all of them, in all of them in less than a microsecond. At the moment, I'm absolutely overwhelmed with that because that's just about right. That's just about doable for us. Anyway, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's what I've got to say. That talk was fascinating. I first heard about Global Mind, sorry, Ocean Mind, about four years ago, and they gave a presentation at the Round Visitor Centre. And what appealed to me then, initially, was the data fusion and the AI and machine learning, but obviously it's the applications to which this technology is put, which really interested me and encouraged me to do So with that, um, do we have some questions from the audience? Go ahead. Yes, so for the different geo types, I noticed there are high accuracy for predicting most of them, but um, for just a few, there's so no accuracy. Was a major issue just getting training data for those um, geo types in the first place? You would think. Oh, repeat the question, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question was distinguishing roughly between the different gear types and how did you train the system to recognize the different gear types? Just before you answer that, you do have three people in the way in the case of the numbers. I have a one. Okay, yes, you would think that would be the case. It is however not the case, and I don't actually know why. Um, some of the very rare examples, I think I identified in that case, the butterfish lifting net. Uh, there were other ones as well, the critical, the krill push net, sorry, tongue tied. The, the, the krill push net, there's not many examples of those vessels going around. Uh, 
and the and, and it identifies those one hundred percent of the time. I think primarily what it is with things like the angiogram lifting net and the angiogram falling net is that the vessel's behaviour is basically the same in the same area at the same time of the day, and you can't tell them apart. And uh, we just have to hope that they do have the right license. It is certainly the case in Thailand that, as far as we can see, everybody behaves themselves really well. So it's not a particular problem there. Well, there's a fair amount of noise in the ocean. Do you do anything about interpreting the sound? This is interesting, Mark. One of my, like one of my colleagues over there is planning to do some work on this if we can get some funding to work out the effect of sound in the ocean. It's certainly the case that um, we know very well that um, sounds in the ocean travel a long way, of course, and they do affect the behaviour of the ocean-based creatures. But we don't really know what's going on. And if we can get some funding, we've got plenty of ideas for things to try. <laughs> but we, we don't do anything at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, just in terms of things to try, given that you have quite a lot of um, very informal data on fishing, have you looked at other ways that can be used? For example, you know, predicting population uh, issues or um, what? Uh, you know, yeah, problems that are beyond the scope of fishing? Yeah, so the question was roughly, are there other applications of the data you've been collecting, for example, forecasting growth of flocks, fleets, flocks of sheep, sheep, uh, fish, shells. Shell, yeah, that's shells. a term I'm looking for. We are not putting any effort into that. I know that other researchers are, and we would like to, but there's only so much you can do with so many people. It's certainly the case that um, the, some researchers around the world are looking at the changes of behavior of fishing and seeing how it changes over time. Now we're getting, the, this, this AIS data has been around in, in good condition for about nearly eight or nine years now. It was been around for longer, but it was very sparse. And you can see how some particular fishing techniques are moving around the world. And perhaps one might be able to spot it when uh, the oceans are warming up, the, the, uh, the range of the tropical type fishing of the long liners moves wider. And it's certainly the case, I'm sure, that people observe that trawling is going further north. Now as well. So I'm sure that is the case. It, it is also the case that uh, I see predictions from a variety of organizations that uh, the amount of fishing that will take place in the oceans in uh, 10 years time is going to be about 20% bigger than it is now. That's nothing to do with aquaculture, that's just fishing in the oceans. 20 aquaculture is also going to rise by more than 20%. Um, so it would be interesting to see how, how, that, how the extra fishing activity affects the uh, behavior of the fishing. Because one thing which I fa failed to say is that a large, large part of the ocean is overfished at the moment, but it need not be. Uh, researchers who know a lot about this can say there's plenty of fish in the ocean, and if it was managed properly, if there was no illegal fishing taking place, um, we, would be, we would not be in a situation where anything was overfished. I've got an anecdote of this, and before I gave this talk, I tried to find the reference to it. I'm going to repeat the anecdote, but I don't have the reference. And that is, um, so it could be wrong, but I'm just competing, speaking junk, that something like twice as much tuna is sold than is actually caught legally. Now, whether that is because um, half of the tuna is, is not is caught illegally, or whether half of the tuna sold is not actually tuna, or somewhere in between, I don't know. But, but there's, uh, estimates from a variety of organizations which suggest that say 28% of all fish caught and sold is illegally caught. And it's higher, it's higher than you believe in some countries. The estimates are for a uh, few research reckons that the estimates for the United States is 30 to 32%, uh, and uh, Europe is actually quite high. China, as you would imagine, is very high as well. Um, no country is very good at this, although some countries are pretty good at it. Belgium's good and Norway's good at it. Um, in some countries, but there's an awful lot of unexplained fishing going taking place. So we have quite a lot of questions on the um, The first one is what does your AI rely on to classify vessels? Also, how do you deal with vessels that go dark by turning off their AIS signal? And how do you deal with Intel delay when counting on satellites? Right, okay, now I have the first one because I've got the memory of the goldfish. That's fine. <laughs> What does your AI rely on to classify vessels? We, at the moment, we rely on the features that we collect. Um, so for the, the, I didn't talk about how we did the, the, the distinction between the 19 different gear types. Uh, a, a little bit of detail is that uh, we collect information about uh, locations of typical fishing, but oh, primarily over a day of behavior. One type of fishing over a day is, looks different to another kind. 
Um, well, just that the computer, as I've already alluded, the trawling looks exactly the same to me, but the computer can tell them apart. And we, we just used that and we got lucky, basically. And we, we found something that was good enough. Long lining is fairly easy to spot because the vessel goes out, it comes back again and does it on a daily basis. So we, we get pretty much all of that. Um, per sailing is much harder to spot because sometimes it's very, very short. And also particularly, it's almost impossible to distinguish between per sailing and transshipment a lot of the time because they're both in last amount the same amount of time and they take about the same amount of space up. So that's the kind of thing that we do there. There's plenty of work to be done here. And if there's a delay in the uh, in satellite signal, uh, I, is your question of talking about um, satellite images or in? Okay, the 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 the, the, sat, the images that sorry the timestamps that we get are provided by the vessel. The the delays are kind of irrelevant, really. We find that nearly everything comes within a minute from the transmission time. It's actually on our servers around the world, which is quite surprising because we, we get so much data coming in. But it's, it takes about a minute most of the time to get ninety nine percent of it in. And then the rest of it dribbles in over the next few minutes. Okay. And another one is how does your algorithm deal with cases involving fishing vessels engaged in AIS spoofing, like what we see next week after this island? Indeed, this is a major challenge at the moment. Uh, one, uh, AIS spoofing is uh, basically a side effect of the insecurity of the AIS system. These systems were originally designed for vessels to avoid collisions, so that it was not in their interest to spoof themselves. It is, however, entirely possible to type in complete junk onto them uh, and, uh, and spoof where you are. Some of them can be spotted because of uh, inconsistencies. A lot of the time you find, that the, you find that the vessel appears to have two tracks around the world, so it goes like this together, and it jumps impossibly quickly between them. And we can spot those kinds of activities going on. But it's an open area of research. We, we just don't know the answers to this one yet. Of course, if the spoofing is really successful, um, the only way you're going to spot it is by trying to find it on satellites or something and seeing it's not there. It's, it's very hard. Well, I'll do one more and then we'll go back to the floor. Um, somebody's asking about how your commission to do this work, government commercial contracts. Yes, okay. We do, I'm afraid, I, I'm not in, I'm, as you can imagine, I'm a researcher, so I'm not terribly up there with this, but we do uh, a good deal of commercial activity and we do a good, a good deal of humanitarian um, research activity that's, uh, that has to be supported by humanitarian support. So we get a lot of support from a variety of people. I mentioned one there, Humanity United. They provide support to us, but there are many of them. I don't personally get involved with those very much. So I'm, I'm not very good on the detail on that, but we do but we do both kinds of activity. I've got a supplementary question. So I haven't said it, I've asked one, only one or asked two. Um, do you collect any data about prosecutions and convictions following reporting of illegal activity? Uh, we do at the moment. I, I'm afraid I'm personally not knowledge free on that almost entirely. I know we've been involved in successful prosecutions and some of my fishing colleagues have given evidence in court which have resulted in successful prosecutions. Um, I personally don't know much about it. Thank you very much. Okay, so do we have some more questions from the audience? I had a question. It sounds like you've got an immense amount of efforts into developing these fast algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, do you license your polygon, polygon code? We don't actually at the moment. Um, it's something we haven't actually put on the road. <laughs> it might be quite fun. I'm, I'm delighted how fast it is. Mm -hmm. It's not very flexible. It's, you know, it's a purpose-built algorithm sure. uh, just, to, just to do this. And um, the index generation takes perhaps a day for each of these shape mm -hmm. files. So adding a new shape in real time is not possible. It's not like an R tree that you would do in, in, in QGIS or something like that. It's not one of those. It's designed just for this one purpose. So it's quite uh, funny tuned. It is, for yes. This particular purpose. Yes, it's just it's, it's designed for just this one purpose. You know, it's, it's a special purpose algorithm, therefore we can ignore all the things we don't need. And another question, what did you choose the Azure Cloud? We, uh, we managed to get uh, sponsoring from Microsoft. Oh, right. Yeah, this is very good. Um, they they provided us with the membership of their AI for Earth uh, funding uh, a few years ago. If you look on their website, they've done a great deal for us. Um, not just provided some Azure uh, time for free, but they provided us with wonderful uh, visual aids, mm -hmm. like the, the image I had at the front that was produced by Microsoft for us to use, and they produced some wonderful videos for us. And it's a lot of help with getting the Azure to work. Because the surprising now, I, I don't know anything about this year, but the actual handling of this amount of data, because it's very small packets coming in, it's, it's, it's not like it's not that much data. It is, it is a lot of data, but it's not that much data. It's just that they're very small packets. Um, is uh, actually really challenged as you, and they couldn't handle it without extra 
extending their own functionality. And so we worked with them on that. That was, it was very, very hard for them to understand. So they got some benefit. Yes, they did, yes, yes. But they'd be extremely good for us. Basically, that's why we use Azure. Yeah. I think about 70% of the internet, internet infrastructure is in international waters, sometimes destroyed by trolls and the like. Also, uh, uh, and it's uh, likely to lead to some in, internet cable wars, I think, around the world. I'm sure we will be up. So, is anything like, um, also, is anyone like Microsoft or Google? Or Facebook, who are investing huge amounts of money, they're showing any interest in your sort of work. Microsoft is, as, as I've just reported, yeah. Google supports a very excellent company, uh, an excellent organization called um, Global Fishing Watch, which was originally from uh, Google employees uh, when they had some free time to use Google equipment to do interesting activities. And I heartily recommend you look at their website. That's all freely available and is very high quality. And they produce very interesting things with uh, Google do from Global Fishing Watch. Uh, other organizations do similar things. Uh, large organizations do similar philanthropic activity to support us as well. well related to the question of accidental damage by trawlers, um, have you detected any intentional damage by vessels? Of well, internet like internet, yeah. No, I haven't. No. The, the activity that you do spot, but we've never really managed to understand is it appears that um, on these long liners and the trawlers, you can actually see them interfering with each other. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, so as you know, the long liners are, for example, I said, have to go up and down like this, otherwise they get tangled. And occasionally they get tangled and you think, well, they know what they're doing. Something, something is going on here. And then all the vessels come together and I have no idea what's going on because it's out in the Pacific somewhere. Uh, that, that, you can spot that, of course, but you yeah. only spot it afterwards. And, you know, there's nobody there to observe. Yeah. Yes. Could you spot the... Um... Green piece of rocks being dropped from the English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know, actually, to be honest. There's so many, so many interesting things that we can do with this data, uh, which I, I, I'm just at, at a loss to how many exciting things that I want to concentrate on. You know, there's only so many of us, and we've got a, a wish list as long as your arm of probably at the moment 70 or 100 man years of interesting things to do. And uh, what do we do before we die, basically? There's so many things. So that carries on to one of the other questions online. Somebody's asking about how your partners use your data. Yes. Do you provide a web portal? Do you provide analyst support? We do. We provide both of those. We provide APIs so that uh, and training as well, so that uh, our partners can use our. I, I display the uh, the API. Well, they display the interfaces, but there's they can access the data in a variety of ways. They have tools themselves. Uh, which they can absorb data from us, uh, which, for example, uh, like those phishing alerts I was saying, they can get direct access to those, uh, or they can use our own tools, and we train them on how to use our, our own tools to do uh, that as well. Yes. And then one last question online. Uh, what are the implications of your inferred data in a legal context? See, so presumably, you're, you're spotting legal activity, you're yes. inferring it to legal activity. Yes, we, we, we believe it's illegal. And as I think I said a couple of minutes ago, we have some been successfully involved in providing evidence to uh, criminal cases which have resulted in conviction. Um, I think what generally happens, and this is speaking just from my experience, because I, I don't get involved in this directly, you know, I'm away from the bottles. I think what happens is, is that people get given a bit of talking to most of the time, but there's not that, certainly in the countries that I've had direct contract with, there's not that much going on. It's obviously illegal. Most of it is accidental. Uh, in the open oceans where, basically anything goes, there's press ganging going on, people being apparently thrown overboard, as I understand it, quite unpleasant activities. There's certainly a load of debt bondage going on there, uh, a variety of slavery techniques. Uh, I have no real knowledge about what's going on there, but we and other, part, other people around the world are trying to build up information to see what's going on, to see how we can spot these things. There's an interesting paper, for example, coming out from uh, Global Fishing Watch, which is on their website, you can have a look to, to show some of the things that people are doing. Who are probably more advanced than we are on some of their some of their research techniques on this. They'd be going in different directions anyway. Say more advanced is going in different directions. There are a couple of very long questions in here. Um, I won't read that, but afterwards perhaps you could answer those on this device. Of course, you? yes. Thank you. I had a short question about the volume of data per yes. day per year, and I guess you store all the data for perpetuity. Yeah. Oh, well, so far it's forever, but we haven't put, we haven't run out. 
I think I said that we can cope with up to a billion data points a day. Uh, we, we don't get a billion data points a day. It's more like 250 million to 500 million at the moment. Uh, and that's, that's all sorted and unique and put immediately available. So the engine has data that's immediately available to it. The analysts have data that's immediately available to it. The data that's going to be routinely processed through the engine is routinely processed point at a time as it comes in. Are we talking gigabytes a day? Oh, or? yes, yes. The things like the AIS and the VMS data points are, I think, something like 200 bytes mm -hmm. a day. So it's many gigabytes a day. Yes. yes. Um, good job we're not, we're not processing the satellite images. We do process satellite mm -hmm. images, but they're huge, of course. And, and we, we, we certainly do research on the satellite image process and to identify vessels and transshipments. But deploying such, act, such technology on the scale that we need is very, very helpful because the, everything is so big. Absolutely. Yes. But, um, but with what we have at the moment, it is those kinds of numbers. Right. Mm. So, all there. Uh, where is our last um, question? Quite thank you for the presentation. You showed basically your model that the rather than present produces really good accuracy in my region. So, I remember you saying about these extra features you can use application salinity. Yes. So what would they enable you to do that you can't already do? Because is that part of the wider use case that we can I, I think it is. We, the, the algorithm makes mistakes, to be sure. Um, but it's very difficult to actually uh, work out where, where to improve the algorithm without concrete information. Um, every time I look, I spend my entire day looking at the stakes of the algorithm. So I get a distorted feature of view to think the algorithm is rubbish because it's making mistakes everywhere. And I'm, I think, why is it, why do vessels behave just like this at this particular point? What it is, is I'm missing some words in English to express what's going on. And I believe that by looking at ocean salinity or looking at weather conditions will improve the, my vocabulary. And therefore, I can extend the grammar to encompass these new words to explain what is going on. Um, so, for example, uh, during the work I was doing with Thailand, there was a lot of fishing activity going on. You could see it going on, then all of a sudden it stopped and everybody, everybody went into a cove. You can kind of guess what it is. It's a, it's a cyclone that comes around. And of course, they all stop and go to shelter. But it'd be really nice to actually build that into the system. Of course, what the engine said was, they're all going to cove and they've gone to anchor. It would be really nice to augment that and saying they've gone to anchor because uh, cyclone Jenny has gone past. Uh, that kind of thing. From your stakeholders' perspective, would they rather see you improve that model accuracy further, or would they rather work on a new kind of one of these tiny use cases you built? Yes, they want, to see, they want to see both. Right. <laughs> yeah, they, they want us to extend the algorithms and reach into new areas. Um, there's plenty of plenty of new countries we could try uh, for doing this detailed analysis. We don't, I've just talked about Thailand a bit, we do it in many countries, we're in 20, 30 countries. Um, but also, they, they want to extend the um, the accuracy as well, because as I've said, the engine has the ability to process a vast amount of data, which inevitably means a vast number of false signals taking place, which humans have to cope with. And if you bury humans with a large amount of false things, they don't like it, and they don't believe the system works very well. Because as I said in that example, the algorithm produces probably 10,000 alerts a day of things taking place just in that small area of the Gulf of Thailand. Almost all of them are right, but the humans only see 50 or 60 of those, and of those 50 or 60 of those, five of them are definitely wrong. And I think, oh, 10% of them are wrong, but of course they're not. You know, if they, you, you, it, there's many thousands of them that are completely right. It's just, it's just that they see a distorted view. As in, I died because I never knew the ones that are right either. I just look at the, the few that are wrong. So they want to see both to make it easier to use and, and happier for the, for the humans as well. So, do we have any further questions? There are some Zoom questions to follow up on later. Cool. So let's thank our speaker again.